Hey everybody, Scout Crafter here again. Uh, Mishmash Monday. It's going to be a little bit of a shorter one today because we, I think we're going to have like three videos in a row coming out because uh, we have our New Year's Eve uh, lantern light off coming up uh, tomorrow. And then I'm going to try and get one out for Wednesday. So they might be a little bit shorter, but there'll be more of them. Uh, first of all, a big thank you. Uh, we celebrated a little bit of a milestone last week. Uh, we we hit our 500th video. Is that insane? 500 videos. I can't believe it. And uh, so, you know, every once in a while I look back at some of them like, I can't believe I forget half the videos I did, you know. So when I go through, I say, oh, that was, I remember that. I remember that. Um, so... Uh, I want to talk real quick. Uh, I have some footage here that I shot the other day. I couldn't squeeze it in because, like I said, I don't want to keep the videos too long. But uh, this was on photography, one of my first hobbies. And uh, I love photography, always have, you know. But I used to love uh, the old time when we used to do film, shoot film cameras. It was a different than it is today, you know. It's still fun today, and the cameras are much better, and, and you could shoot 150, 200 pictures and not have to worry. Where back then, you know, if you shot 24, it was getting a little bit expensive. You went for two rolls and then developing. And some of the old timers probably remember what I'm saying. But uh, let me show you some cameras I dug up the other day when I was looking up for some Bakelite stuff. Now, the funny thing is, like the dinosaurs, um, film had a really good run before uh, eventually it was overtaken by digital cameras and then, then phased. And just like the dinosaur... It was here one day and gone the next. You know, film cameras now are practically uh, not used and kind of useless, but I, I still enjoy it. And I always, you know, when you took so long learning a hobby, you know, you don't want to just give it up like that. Uh, here's a couple of cameras. Uh, you know, one of my things, I collect a lot of uh, older cameras. And when I was a kid, I used to go to this antique shop in Long Island. And it was called the Browsery, and it was there was a guy there named Frank, great, great guy. And Frank uh, and I really got along great. He was a former Marine, and he, he liked me. And so and I never, ever bargained with him. Whatever Frank's price was, I said, so he, he liked me for that reason. So uh, I used to go in there and pick out like five or ten of these. He always had tons of these plastic cameras, they're Bakelite. And I used to go pick them out, and he'd be like, okay, and you know, give me like $3 a piece or whatever. And I, and I would do that every few months, and I got boxes of them. But uh, I always thought one day that these would be worth something, but it turns out that film <laughs> film has gone the way of the dodo bird. So um, when I first started out, these are this was my mother's favorite camera, actually. It was a, a brownie, and uh, you know, these things were, were classic in their simplicity. And it had a flash unit that could go on here, and I, I must have a dozen of these. And and there's a little viewfinder here that you would look through to put somebody in your in the picture. And here's the shutter. It was a simple one shutter speed, one picture. If you didn't get it right, you didn't get a good picture. And to open it, there was a little notch here, and you slid that open, and that's where the film wrapped around. Um, very interesting design, and uh, it's still... To this day, you know, it will still work if you you know, get the film that used a, a, a 620 film. And they made a lot of different Bakelite cameras at, back then. Here's a, a, a little simple one. It was like a travel camera. And to, uh, to operate it, you can lift this little latch up here and that would be your viewfinder to put people in the view. And uh, But let me show you this camera here. Because this is a really, a lot of people have seen these, but don't know how they work, and it's really interesting. Now, one of my favorite cameras that I always used to play with, even as a kid, was these fold-out type cameras. And I, uh, they were real popular from the 20s through the 50s. Uh, this one here is uh, is made by Ansco, or Agfa, and uh, it was a, a typical simple camera for a fold-out. It didn't have a lot of options, but it was, uh, you know, when you're stepping up to the higher end, it was a leatherette case. It was a, you know, a steel case that was uh, covered with a, a type of a, a vinyl or leatherette. It was really nicely made. Uh, let me show you how it works. Now, next to the re rewind uh, wheel, there was a little button here, and you push that button, and it would pop out like this. Now, when you open it up, the bellows would come out. These are called the bellows of the camera. And um, that would give you your focal length from the lens to the uh, to the negative that would be back here. And what's interesting is, when you look at the, uh, the lens there, um, you could see here, to operate the shutter, there was a little button back here. You could see the red. You would push that button, and there was a... Uh, you could see a rod that would come up here and just this would move over to the right. So when I push the button, if I put this on 
regular over here, the first setting. This would take a picture with a, uh, you could see it, it'd be about a 30th of a second, you know. It was a standard daytime, you know, there was no setting the uh, the shutter speed on here. Now, the shut, to set the uh, depth of field, there was this little arrow here, and you could see the, the, the uh, aperture moving in and out like that. And that's how you'd set the depth of field. Now, if you needed a longer exposure, you would move this over to what's called time. See that low line? I moved it over the time. Now, when I push the, the shutter release, watch the shutter in there. See it opened up? Now my hand's off the, the trigger. I'll push it again. It would close it. So you push it once to open, once to close. Very simple. Um, another simple thing is the viewfinder. Uh, when you held the camera vertically, this uh, viewfinder was shaped like a cross. You would use the vertical part of that box to uh, to get somebody in the picture. Now, if you turn the camera sideways like this, you would turn the little viewfinder like this, and you would use the the square that looks like a, like a uh, a rectangle over here. See, and you would use that to get them in in focus. Now, if you turn the camera up, if you you see the little. Uh, quarter by 20 adapter here for a tripod if you put it on a tripod or you're holding it like this you could flip this up and use it like that to take a picture you know and uh so, so it had all kinds of cool features on it for a, a simple camera to see where you, how many uh exposures you had left you lift up this little window and you would usually see a number in there it would show you what exposure you what uh you're on and uh another interesting thing is when you uh wanted to open this up let me close it here to close it you just push these two buttons folds right back up and another thing you see this little lever here that's if you wanted to stand it up uh let's say you didn't have a tripod and uh you wanted to take a picture you could just take it like this and it would stand up you could see that it stands up like this and it would be level and you could take the picture using that um to oh to see what the inside Over here looks like. you'll see it says a lift up and there's a little rolled piece of steel here and you would uh, basically pull up on that and it would open up the back of the camera. Now uh, here's the type of film you would use uh, that would also be a 616 uh, Kodak film I believe and um, what you would do is it was interesting is you kept there was a, a reel that the film came on and uh, you would take it and you would place it into the camera here. And uh, when you were finished, you would take the empty reel and place it over here for the take-up reel. Uh, to uh, to get access to it, you pull out this little handle here like this. And this carriage flips forward for you to get you access to, uh, to winding the film. But you would basically string the film here and then turn it, wind up the film until it says number one. When it says number one, you close the camera and you are ready to go. Usually you had maybe eight to 12 uh, exposures. But... It's so interesting, right? Like it was so simple and bulletproof, more or less. And this thing's you know, 100 years old and it will still take pictures just the way it did back then. I used to love it until a couple of years ago. I was still taking pictures with a lot of my older cameras, but it's expensive. It's like $20 for a roll be between buying it for $5 for the film and another 15 to develop. You know, it got a little Okay, pricey. next up on the mosh, uh, my sister, uh, my my sister was born on Christmas. Isn't that great? What a, what a fantastic gift my dad always said it was on Christmas. Anyway, she gave me a terrific book on um, that I want to share with you that uh, I think you'd enjoy. So let's go now, check it out. Now, here's the book that she got me. It's called The Dictionary of Hand Tools, uh, Pictorial Synopsis. And it's, uh, it's, he, it's a Schiffer book for collectors. And, and I guess you could consider myself a collector of sorts. And uh, it's got over 540 pages of uh, tools and their their names. And I have a big problem because a lot of the tools I I have on, on the show, I, I don't know the proper name for. And I'm guilty of that because, uh, you know, I'm just a, a guy that collects tools. Like, for example, uh, you know, a lot of times I call these old monkey wrenches. But you can see uh, the different, you know, here's a Coe's patent and, uh, you know, all the different styles, you know. And uh, what's so great about this book is that it'll help identify a lot of the tools that we do. And you can see um, how many different tools that we've done and also how many that we've yet to do. Um, what I find so interesting is that when you get to a, some parts here, like, uh, for example, when we get to the hammer section. Oh, geez, there's so many hammers that you don't even know about. 
or that you've never really uh, took a chance to find out the actual name or what it's used for, um, this will help that. And uh, as we go through these, I'm just uh, browsing through the book quickly because I want to show you a couple things. Uh, it was funny. I, I was I was looking at the hatchet first. I was at the axe area. You know, so many different types of axes. And then I went to the hatchets, and it was like five or six pages of hatchets. So, as you can see, and it's uh, the way it's categorized, it's uh, done both alph alphabetically and according to uh, what somebody might do for a living, you know, like a machinist or something like that. So, you can find it different way. Here, we're getting into some pliers. Obviously, I've done a few of those. Um, I'm due for another. A lot of uh, planes and... Uh, you know, picks, and this is just terrific, isn't it? I mean, all these, uh, everything you can possibly want to learn what it's called or what the name is. A lot of leatherworking tools that are unusual. A lot of older tools. Look here, just just to, here for the, uh, uh, this is, now shoemakers would use a lot of these tools, but all different types. When you come across, let me say, I came across this, this strange blade, and I wondered what it was for, and you know, this will tell you. So I thought this was a great gift for my sister, especially for someone like me or or us who enjoy the tool restoration hobby. You can really find out what a lot of names of tools are. Uh, we're getting into the, getting close to the front of the book. Oh, and the clamps. <laughs> like we've not done a bunch of clamps there. But I didn't know this was a carriage maker's clamp. You know, we've done a few of those. And the machinist clamp. You see the difference in the uh, the back here? Um, just lovely book. And uh, let me show you some of the axes here because I got a kick out of that of how many axes there were. Here we go. You know, uh, all the different patterns of axes. And that's important because depending on where you are, you know, you have a, you know, this was... Uh, different, you know, you had your uh, Pennsylvania had different axes than, than New York, and uh, we have a, a New York axe over here. Uh, let me just get it here. Look at all these different type of axes there are, and patterns, Michigan pattern, you know, they were always the double edge. And you can just go on and on just for, here's the New York pattern I was talking about. And you can see, you can see how many different types there were, you know, and that's just axes. We didn't even get to the hatches or, or under H, but I just thought it was a great book. And so if you have any questions, a lot of times, sometimes you mail me a picture or something and I would, I take a guess, but now at least I have something I can reference it by. So I want to thank my okay, sister. Okay, next up, speaking of hammers, I, I was at Home Depot the other day uh, buying bird seed again, and I, uh, I found a hammer that I just thought I, I just had to pick up. You know, it's around the holidays. I like to treat myself to something. So let's go and check it out. here's the hammer that I just picked up. It's a little S-wing. Uh, it's a cute little thing, isn't it? It's a little two pound hand sledgehammer. See, it says two pound there. You can just about read it. But this is such a nice little hammer and I'll show you why I like it. But the first thing I do is take off. I don't like stickers on my, especially what happens is, you know, when you try and peel these off, some of them come off, but then look what happens. A lot of them, they, they peel off like that. And then you, you're picking at it and stuff. And, and I'll show you the best way I found to get this crap. Now, the off. best chemical I've ever found for removing this sticky residue or anything like that is, uh, is good old fashioned Ronsonol lighter flu, lighter fluid. Now, What's uh, interesting about this is now the main ingredient for most lighter fluids is naphtha, you know, but there is also in Ronsonol, they also have a small amount of oil in here. And that's why some guys, some even old watch uh, watchmakers and things like that would use just to free up some of their, you know, watch gears and stuff because it has, uh, and you can see here, an excellent removing grease, oil stains, tar, uh, tar and labels. Oh, great for tar too. But, um, I've, I haven't found anything better than this, and especially if you have, you know, some residue stick on here, just let it saturate like that for a second, you know, and uh, you just let it sit there for a second, and that'll take all the, uh, the, the, the glue that's under this stickers, and it'll make it so much easier to peel up, and you can see here, it's only been on for a second, but it comes up so nicely, see, and it loosens up the glue, and, uh, and then you can wipe it off and peel that off. Now, once you have the sticker off, you can put a little bit on some paper towel and uh, just wipe it over here. 
and you know turn it a little bit and you'll see it takes it all off and it's also a very good cleaner especially for a lot of these plastics and things like that and what a nice job it does and it doesn't leave any oil or anything it's just this is the stuff to have uh pick up some you won't regret it I, i'm telling you i use this a lot now when i said this little sledgehammer was, was cute i wasn't kidding uh two pounds is about the smallest uh sledge style hammer that you'll find here is my uh, dedicated punch hammer and you can see this is a, a brass hammer and I'm just showing you the size wise and this is about 14 ounces or so but this is just it's a nice weight I always tend to choke up a little bit on my especially if I'm doing uh, some kind of stamping or punching or if I want to use like a, a small anvil and uh, bang down some you know copper tubing straight and some uh, tubing out things like that so uh, this hammer just really feels nice. The only thing is, I like the fiberglass handle, of course, on here because I'm not going to be doing a lot of whaling with this, but uh, it's made in Taiwan. It's the uh, Estwing used to make a lot of this stuff in America. Now it's made in Taiwan, but you know, like I, I'm a fan of uh, Taiwanese. So you could see they're made in Taiwan. And I'm a fan of Taiwanese stuff, but the, usually American steel is better. So I don't know if they're important our steel. They, I don't know what the case is. So I'll run it through some tests, see how it holds up. But it just looks like a, it feels like a nice hammer. It looks like a nice hammer. That runs about $15. So in closing, like I said, today was going to be a little bit of a short one. Uh, tomorrow we'll do our lantern lighting for New Year's Eve. And I can't believe 2020, huh? Is that amazing? And, uh, and then Wednesday, we'll be back with another one. So thanks very much. Hope you have a nice day. Take care now. Bye-bye.